We want to turn our attention today to the subject of faith. When we come to the issue of faith, we come to one of the most important issues of biblical salvation and justification. It's an issue that is of supreme importance, one which was foundational to the controversies of the Reformation and to the biblical teaching of salvation. The Scriptures teach us that God communicates saving grace to those who believe on the basis of the finished work of Jesus Christ. The grace of justification and salvation is channeled to men, not by sacraments, but by faith. Faith is foundational to true Christianity. Over and over again, Scripture emphasizes this point. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. Paul said, for we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that none of yourselves is a gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast. Over and over again, the Word of God tells us that salvation is directly related to faith. It is therefore of paramount importance. But it is a teaching which has been greatly perverted, not only by the Roman Catholic Church, but also by certain movements within Protestantism. The Roman Catholic Church affirms the importance and necessity of faith, but as with the biblical teaching on repentance, which over time became corrupted by the Roman dogma of penance, so the biblical meaning of faith has also been corrupted by the teachings of the church. When the scriptures speak of faith, there are a number of different emphases which need to be mentioned if we're to understand in what way the Roman church has gone astray in its teachings. At the same time, this will help us to understand where certain segments of the Protestant church have departed from the biblical norm. Biblical faith involves four major categories. It involves knowledge, assent, trust, and commitment. This is to say that faith is a response to the revelation of God. Knowledge implies the communication and understanding of truth. There cannot be a proper response of faith and assent and trust and commitment apart from the foundation of knowledge. And this underscores the vital importance of objective truth given by God and of our understanding that truth. The truth that God has given is the word of God. And the essential embodiment of that truth relative to salvation is what Scripture calls the gospel. The Scriptures emphasize over and over again the importance of the gospel message. For apart from a true understanding of that message and a proper response to it, no man can be saved. What then are the essential aspects of the gospel message? The scriptures are an authoritative revelation of God and the way of salvation. It is through scripture that one understands the nature of God and the content of the gospel message. This is a message about God and man and how men can be forgiven for their sins and reconciled to God. It's a message about Christ his work of salvation, and what man's response is to be to that work. And Scripture clearly tells us that the message of the gospel is a message that is fixed in content. It is not something that develops over time and can be added to in content. Scripture emphasizes in very strong terms the fact that the gospel is a message from God himself, and any deviation from the content of that message incurs a divine anathema. Paul makes that as clear as crystal. In Galatians 1, when he says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you <clears throat> and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even though we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to that which you received, let him be accursed. And what these comments demonstrate is that in Paul's day, the gospel was a completed message. This is evident also from Jude's statement that we are to contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. This is a body of truth whose contents have been preserved in the New Testament. Paul's warning also underscores another important truth. It is essential that the gospel message be given to men in the totality of the content as it was given by God and not be added to or diminished in any way. And this is what Paul accuses certain men of doing in his letter to the Galatian churches, of distorting the gospel of Christ 
And the reason he's so upset is that if men respond to a distorted gospel, they will not be responding to truth, but to a distortion of truth. And they will be misled and deceived as to the issues of eternity and salvation. If men respond to a distorted gospel, they will not experience salvation, and they will go into eternity lost. The scriptures, therefore, emphasize the importance of truth and of men hearing that truth and responding to it in the way that God has directed it if they are to experience salvation. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 2. Paul underscores the relationship between the message that he preached and the experience of salvation of those who received it. He said, now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you were saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Paul preached a certain message. These people received it and responded to it in faith. And Paul says, it is by this message that they are saved. And he emphasizes the absolute importance of continuing to hold fast to that message and not deviating from it. So he's underscoring the absolute importance of the gospel and its relationship to the salvation of men as they respond correctly to its message. There can be no salvation for men apart from a correct understanding of and response to that message. Paul emphasizes this fact in the book of Romans when he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation for all those who believe. What is the content of that message, the message of the gospel? Well, Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians 15 to detail for us what that means when he says this. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. The message has to do with the person and work of Jesus Christ. Paul told the Corinthians, we preach Christ Jesus. The focus of Paul's message is the person of Jesus Christ. So the essential elements of the gospel message have to do with the person of God, man's problem with sin, which is a direct relationship with his relationship to God, God's answer to that problem and the person and work of Jesus Christ, and what man's response is to be to that work. Now, again, it's vital to emphasize the importance the Scripture places on the importance of truth and the gospel and man's salvation. In Ephesians 1, Paul says, In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Paul describes the gospel here as a message of truth. And he points out that it is after they have heard this message and have understood it and have responded to it in faith, that they are sealed into Christ by the Holy Spirit and they experience salvation. He also brings out this point in Romans 10 when he talks about the Jews. And he says that his prayer is for their salvation, for they have a zeal for God, he says, but not in accordance with knowledge. And he points out that the knowledge that they are deficient in is a knowledge of the gospel and God's way of salvation. And then in Philippians, Paul again emphasizes the importance of the truth of the gospel relative to the truth or relative to the true worship of God. He says that men cannot worship God rightly where there has been a distortion of the message of the gospel and an incorrect response based on a false message. It's the same teaching that Jesus himself gives when he says God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Truth, and in particular the truth of the gospel, are absolutely essential to salvation. So the essential message of the gospel has to do with the person and work of Jesus Christ in accomplishing salvation. And according to Scripture, man's response is to be one of faith to the revelation of that truth. It starts with a knowledge of the message, and then it moves to the response of the individual to it. Now, the object of faith is always God himself. And the foundation to faith is the word of God. But for faith to be truly biblical... It must involve more than just the ascent of the mind and the reception in the mind to objective truth about God and Christ and salvation. Knowledge and ascent are very important and that there must be a proper foundation of knowledge and an embracing of that knowledge to be true. But knowledge must always lead to a response to God as a person or the faith is inadequate. It is not fully biblical. <clears throat> Scripture teaches that salvation is mediated to the person who believes in Christ. 
who comes to Christ, who receives Christ, and who is sealed in Christ by the Holy Spirit. This means that he receives knowledge about the person of Christ and his work. He believes this to be true and then responds to the person of Christ as the object and source of salvation. This is what Scripture means when it says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, John 1.12. This is why Christ constantly appealed to men to come to him directly and personally by faith to appropriate salvation. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle, or rather I am meek and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. The underlying foundation to faith then is the knowledge that Christ himself is the object and only source of salvation. Now, this is emphasized in Scripture, where Jesus says, for example, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And then Peter says the same thing in Acts 4.12, where he says there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Scripture teaches us. There is only one way that God has given for men to be saved, and that is through his Son, who is both Lord and Savior. And then it tells us that there is only one way that salvation that is available in Christ can be appropriated, and that is through repentance and faith. Knowledge of truth and assent to it are vital, but true saving faith involves more than intellectual assent to truth. Throughout the New Testament, we find the two conditions of faith and repentance emphasized together as well as separately. For example, in Mark 1.15, the Lord Jesus says, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. In Luke 13.3, he says, Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. In Luke 5.32, he says he came to call sinners to repentance. The Lord Jesus Christ, John the Baptist, the apostles Peter and Paul, all preach repentance as a necessary condition for salvation. And in the same way, faith is emphasized in the word of God as a necessary condition for salvation. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And Paul states, by grace you have been saved through faith. Then Paul summed up the message that he preached in Acts 20 when he says that he preached repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance. And faith. What do repentance and faith mean? Repentance and faith basically are two sides, if you, if you want an illustration, of the same coin. Dr. Augustus Strong says this. Repentance is that voluntary change in the mind of the sinner in which he turns from sin. Being essentially a change of mind, it involves a change of view, a change of feeling, and a change of purpose. Faith is that voluntary change in the mind of the sinner in which he turns to Christ. The voluntary element is trust in Christ as Lord and Savior, or to distinguish its two aspects. Number one, surrender of the soul is guilty and defiled to Christ's governance, that is his rule. Number two, reception and appropriation of Christ as the source of pardon and spiritual life. The essential thought in repentance and faith is that of turning. Repentance is turning from, while faith is turning to, and the result is commitment in the form of self-surrender and trust in the person of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Repentance literally means a change of mind. It has to do with sin. It means a change of mind regarding sin with a basic result that one turns from sin. That is, one forsakes it and then turns to Christ. But the Roman Catholic Church has redefined the word to mean penance which means an attempt through works to pay God back for sin rather than a complete forsaking of it. The biblical repentance means a complete forsaking and turning from sin. What this means, therefore, is that true biblical faith, that is saving faith, is a repentant faith. You cannot separate the one from the other. Salvation and its appropriation comes from the exercise of repentant faith. Well, let's look at each of these elements individually in some detail, to see what exactly it means to turn to Jesus as Savior and Lord. For repentance and faith will be applied to both aspects of his person. Well, first of all, Jesus is the Savior. 
as we've seen in detail in our sessions <clears throat> on the Eucharist and confession and penance and justification, inherent in this concept is the fact that Jesus Christ is a complete Savior. His work is sufficient in itself. As we've seen, there is nothing that can be added to it to improve upon it or to complete it. This means there can be no addition of human works or merit of any kind, be they moral, religious, or social, of any kind, which an individual looks to or trusts in as a grounds for his forgiveness and acceptance with God. It is Christ's work alone, his merits, his blood and righteousness alone, which can make a man right with God. This is why Scripture tells us over and over again that salvation is not secured on the basis of human works, but by personal faith and trust in Jesus Christ, which means a complete repudiation of all works of any kind as a grounds of acceptance with God and of gaining forgiveness with him. As we saw in our study on justification, God demands that his law be fulfilled perfectly. He demands death for transgression and a perfect obedience to go to heaven. Now, in and of myself, I am a hopeless sinner because I have transgressed God's laws times without number. No amount of good works can offset the guilt of my sin before a holy God and gain his approval. Only the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ will meet my need, for it is this alone which fulfills the law of God as the foundation for my salvation. I must therefore renounce my pride and humble myself before God as one who is totally incapable of pleasing him or being able to do anything to earn my salvation. I must be willing to receive by faith as a gift the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on my behalf. I trust in him to wash me and cleanse me in his blood and to clothe me in his righteousness, to impute to me his righteousness. Repentance and faith then, as they relate to Jesus as Savior, meaning a turning from all human works by which one attempts to gain eternal life. And it means a turning to Jesus Christ as a person, believing that his work is sufficient, and then receiving him into one's life, literally appropriating him and assimilating him into one's life to be one's Savior and trusting in his merits alone. Scripture says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. That none of yourselves is a gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Salvation does not come by human works, but through faith. Faith is the very antithesis of works. To add works of any kind to justification nullifies grace, nullifies faith, and nullifies the gospel. If an individual could do anything to add to the work of Christ that would in any way merit heaven by something that he is or has done, it would completely undermine the sufficiency of the atonement. As Paul puts it in Galatians 2, if righteousness comes through the law, that is, favor and acceptance with God through human works, then Christ died needlessly. To trust in anything apart from the work of Jesus Christ alone as a source of acceptance and forgiveness with God is sin. It's pride. It is rebellion against God because it is a rebellion against what he has told us in his word. And it must be repudiated. And that's illustrated for us by Paul in the book of Philippians. In Philippians chapter 3, the apostle Paul writes to warn the Philippian believers against certain persons he describes as dogs, evil workers, and false circumcision. Because they were responsible for perverting the gospel of Jesus Christ by turning it into a legalistic system. They didn't deny the importance and the necessity of Christ and his work. They just added to his work the works of Judaism, the works of circumcision, the priesthood, sacrifices, and religious and moral works. Now, Paul uses himself as an example to demonstrate the futility of their whole system. He gives us a short description of himself as he faced the issues of salvation and the work of Jesus Christ. And what he does is to list for us his credentials. He says, if anyone has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. See, if there was ever a man who, from a human perspective, could stand before God because of what he was and because of what he had done, it was Paul. He lists for us his achievements, his heredity, his position in society, his zealous works. He says, circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, 
as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, which is in the law, found blameless. Yeah, at one time, Paul had a very high estimate of himself. From a human perspective, no one could match Paul for zeal, for morality, for purity of heredity, or religious observance. And yet, what does he tell us had to become of his estimate of those things in his mind if he was going to come to know Jesus Christ and be saved? His answer is crystal clear. Whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ, more than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. And you note here that Paul does not say that he received grace as a gift from God to perform acts of righteousness, but the gift is righteousness itself, a righteousness which has already been worked out for him. Now, keep in mind here, righteousness is a work. If a man is doing righteous work, he is working. It may be by the grace of God that he's doing a work, but it is something he is doing. Paul is receiving righteousness as a gift. It's a work completed. It's already done. And Paul had to come to the point where he saw that all his achievements and good works were worthless in God's eyes, that Paul was nothing more than a bankrupt sinner with a proud heart. He therefore had to turn from all his good works and his high estimate of himself. He came to Jesus Christ <clears throat> by faith with empty hands, to cast himself on his mercy and to receive a salvation which is perfect, but which he himself had not achieved. It had been achieved for him. He had to renounce his Jewish religion with its priesthood, its sacrifices, its temple worship, its ritual, its feast days, its circumcision, and the tradition of its elders. He could not trust in these things and in Jesus Christ at the same time. He tells us that he counted all these things loss, that he might gain Christ and by faith receive a salvation, for which he did not need to work. In other words, he turned from self-righteousness to Jesus as Savior. And in so turning, he received the perfect righteousness of Jesus as a gift. This salvation cannot be earned by human work of any kind. It cannot be merited by human works. It must be received as a gift of God based solely upon his mercy and grace. This is what Paul says in, in the book of Romans in chapter 4, he says, To the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. See, the problem with the people that Paul writes about in Romans 10, he says they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. They're trying to establish their own righteousness. They do not understand the whole issue of salvation, that it is not something a man can achieve. Any attempt to add human works as a ground of acceptance with God is to pervert the gospel and to teach that the work of Jesus Christ is insufficient in and of itself to save us. Yet the Roman Catholic Church does exactly this by teaching that men can gain God's forgiveness and merit his grace through the sacraments, indulgences, church membership, good works, moral living, the enduring of suffering. None of this is meant to discount the importance of living a holy life. The person who truly becomes a Christian will live a holy life, as we will see. What we're discussing here is how a person is saved and receives acceptance and forgiveness with God. For that to become a reality, there must be a renouncing of all human works, be they religious, moral, or social, and then a turning to Jesus to be one Savior, to rest in his work and his person alone. Baptism. Church membership, church attendance, good works, sacraments, indulgences, sacrifices, moral living, none of those things can satisfy God. They will never save an individual. They will never aid in the salvation of an individual. Only Jesus Christ can save. So then I must turn from all self-righteousness to Jesus and receive him into my life to be my Savior and trust completely and solely in his blood and righteousness. 
to give me forgiveness and acceptance with God, to trust in the sufficiency of his atonement, his work. Imagine my thinking that I can add to his work in any way what he has done on the cross. That's an abomination. If a Roman Catholic is to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, he must follow Paul's example and renounce the religion of Roman Catholicism with all of its human traditions, its rituals, priesthoods, sacrifices, and works. That entire religion is an attempt to add to the work of Jesus Christ and to cause an individual to put his trust in a church and sacraments and in his own moral and religious works rather than in the person and the merits of Jesus Christ alone. Sola Christus, Christ alone. This means there must be a trust in the sufficiency of Jesus' work of salvation. And that means a turning from all human works to merit or earn God's forgiveness. Whenever the word of God speaks of faith in the context of salvation, it always, without exception, emphasizes the fact that salvation is not gained by human works. So there must be a forsaking of all human merit and a total trust in Christ himself and his merits to give one forgiveness and acceptance with God. So biblical faith not only involves the characteristics of knowledge and assent, but also personal trust in Christ as Savior. But in addition to knowledge, assent, and trust, there's one other important characteristic of biblical faith which must be mentioned. This is the aspect of commitment to Christ as Lord. Saving faith not only involves personal trust in Jesus Christ as Savior, but total commitment and surrender of the life to him as Lord. Unless Jesus becomes Lord of a person's life, he will not become his Savior. Now, how is repentance and faith exercised with respect to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? The issue here revolves around turning from sin. Many people have a very shallow view of sin. They think that it entails outward behavior alone such as adultery, murder, or thievery. But sin, in essence, is man's failure to fulfill the purpose for which he was created. Each and every one of us has been created by God to live for his will and glory. If you want to know your purpose, that is your purpose, to live for the glory of God. Man was made to live in absolute dependence on God, under his authority and rule, and to love him supremely above everything else on this earth. Sin is man's rebellion against his creator in order to live for himself, for the pursuit and the fulfillment of selfish ambitions and interests, rather than for the kingdom of God and his will and his interests. Sin is a life that is focused and centered upon self. It's a man living for himself as the center of his own universe. Such a man may give acknowledgement to God, might be very religious, outwardly moral, but at the center of his heart, it is the man who rules his own life and directs it for his own purposes. He calls the shots. As a result, because men are not surrendered to God in their hearts, the result is that men live in sin. They do not obey the word of God inwardly in their hearts and all too often outwardly in their actions. Because God does not have his rightful place in men's hearts, their behavior, in their thoughts and in their motives, in their attitudes and in their speech and in their actions, their behavior is sinful and unrighteous. It contradicts the word of God. Men can be deceived into thinking that because they are part of a church and actively involved and live outwardly moral lives that they are right with God. And that's true for Roman Catholics as well as Protestants. That's a terrible deception. Man can live an impeccably moral life and be very religious and give generously of his money and do many good works and take strong moral stands against such evils as abortion and have a heart that is full of pride because he has never surrendered to Jesus Christ. Listen to this definition of sin by J.I. Packer. What, he says, in positive terms is the essence of sin, playing God. And as a means to this, refusing to allow the creator to be God so far as you are concerned. Living not for him, but for yourself. Loving and serving and pleasing yourself without reference to the creator. Trying as far as possible to be independent of him 
taking yourself out of his hands, holding him at arm's length, keeping the reins of life in your own hands, acting as if you and your pleasure were the end to which all things else, God included, must be made to function as a means. That is the attitude in which sin essentially consists. Sin is exalting oneself against the Creator, withholding the homage due to Him, and putting oneself in His place as the ultimate standard of reference in all life's decisions. Well, salvation is the reversing of that kind of living. It is not only deliverance from the guilt of sin, but also from the power of sin. It is not only justification, it also includes sanctification. In salvation, an individual is restored to that original purpose for which he was created, to be under the authority and the rule of God, to live for his will and glory. Repentance, remember, is directed towards God. Remember what Paul said when he, what he preached? Repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance, therefore, is turning from sin. It is turning from self-will and self-rule and the forsaking of living for this world and everything on this earth, which is opposed to God and his will, that one might henceforth live to know and do the will of God for his glory. Now, this aspect of faith is emphasized in a number of key passages by the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to go over a couple of these because the ultimate authority in salvation is Jesus Christ. In Mark 8, verses 31 to 38, Jesus has some very sobering words. It says this, He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he was stating the matter plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. And he summoned the multitudes with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels shall save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Jesus gathers his disciples together along with a crowd, in order to address them. He has something of the utmost importance to say with regard to what it means to follow him. And his words are clear, they're sharp, penetrating, they're unmistakable in their meaning. This passage opens with three commands, and then he goes on in the verses that follow to explain why it is so important to obey those commands. The Lord begins by saying that if any man is determined to come after him, he's going to have to do three things. Deny himself, take up his cross, follow him. Then he makes this statement. For whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels shall save it. And I understand what Jesus is saying. It is essential that we examine a number of key words and phrases that he uses to get their precise meaning. The word follow in the Greek language is the word akoluthos which means a commitment to be a disciple. And in this context, it means the committing of one's life unreservedly to the lordship, the rulership, and the authority of Jesus Christ. It means a decision to live for his will. And Jesus is saying that anyone who comes to him for salvation must understand what that means. It will mean a life committed to him to be his follower. That is, one whose whole purpose in life is to do the will of Jesus Christ. A disciple is a follower of Christ. This means more than a mere learner. I mean, if you look up the word in the Greek language, it literally means a learner. But Jesus expands that meaning to mean more than just a learner. It means to be a follower. It is one who has unreservedly committed his life to Christ, to be ruled and directed by him, and to live a life of obedience to him under that rule. But in order for anyone to make this commitment, Jesus says there are two things which must be done. In other words, in order to turn to him, we must first of all turn from something. There is self to be denied and a cross to be taken up. And self is the big issue. To deny self means to forget yourself. 
The Amplified Bible puts it this way. It's to forget, to ignore, to disown, to lose sight of oneself and one's own interests. It's to disown oneself utterly, completely, and altogether. There must be a resolute turning from self and an end of living for oneself. There is, in other words, a repudiation of self-will. And Jesus says, we must take up a cross. Now, obviously, he does not mean a literal physical cross. He's speaking here in metaphorical terms. The cross speaks of death. During Roman times, it was used as an instrument of execution. It meant death for all its victims. Here, Jesus is referring specifically to a death to self. Now, this means a turning from ruling and controlling one's own life, along with the personal ambitions and interests which dominate that life, and a giving of oneself and total abandonment to the Lord Jesus Christ to live for him and to follow him as Lord. And Paul emphasizes this truth in Galatians 5 when he says that all who belong to Christ, who are true Christians, have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. In other words, a death has taken place. Now, immediately following these statements that Jesus makes, he gives a warning regarding what he has just said. It is imperative that we heed his words, for both obedience and disobedience have eternal consequences. First, he tells us the consequences for refusing to obey his words. For he who seeks to save his life shall lose it. The one seeking to save his life is contrasted here with the one who denies himself and takes up a cross. The former refuses to die to himself and to renounce living for himself. That's to save your life, to hold on to your life. He refuses to submit his life to Jesus as Lord in order to live for him. And Jesus says that the individual who keeps himself as the center of his life will lose it. The word lose in Greek means perish. It's the same word that is used in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That word means to die eternally. So what Jesus is dealing with here is eternity. And that becomes very clear in the next verse when he says, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? For what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? The issue here is that of salvation. Jesus is defining conditions for entering the kingdom of God. The Greek scholar R.C.H. Linsky brings out this point in his commentary on this verse. He says, this is not self-denial in the current sense of the word, but true conversion, the very first essential of the Christian life. Self is thus cast out and Christ enters in. Henceforth you live not unto yourself, but unto Christ who died for you. Paul, in 2 Corinthians 5.15, he puts it the same way when he says, He died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. William Hendrickson, the Reformed commentator, says essentially the same thing in commenting on this verse. He says, We must be careful, however, not to conceive of this self-denial in a chronological fashion, as if the Lord were exhorting his hearers to practice self-denial for a while, then after a lapse of time to take up and carry the cross, and once having shouldered that burden for another time period to follow Jesus. The order is not chronological but logical. Together the three indicate true conversion, followed by lifelong sanctification. So in contrast to the person then who seeks to save his life, who hold on to his life, is the one who Jesus describes as losing his life for his sake in the Gospels. That one, he says, will save his life. Now, from this contrast, it becomes very apparent that a man can do one of two things with his life. He can save it for himself or he can lose it. That is, he can die to it and commit himself unreservedly to Jesus Christ. The result of the latter will be eternal salvation. That is, giving up a life dominated by selfish interests for the sake of another and his interests. The gospel, you see, represents the interests of God in this world. And Jesus said, he who loses his life for my sake in the gospels will save it. There is that turning then away from my own interests 
to commit myself to God and the things that dominate his heart, the things that are of interest to him to live for those things. So Jesus is saying that there is a fundamental shift that must take place in a man's life from self-rule to total submission and from living for self-interest to living for God's interests. His life must become dominated by the will of God and by God himself. He no longer lives for his own sake. Jesus now reigns as Lord in his heart. Self has been dethroned, and that life has one foremost concern, to live for the will and glory of God and to see his interests furthered in this world. Only such a person has experienced salvation and is a Christian. A person is not a Christian because he is Roman Catholic or Protestant. They are a Christian only if they have embraced Jesus Christ as Savior and committed their lives to him to be his follower in submission to him as Lord. Now, this is further emphasized by Jesus in another passage of Scripture. It's a very familiar passage to many people. It's Luke 14, verses 26 to 33. We live in a day when the conditions for discipleship that are taught by Jesus Christ have been relegated by many to an optional commitment, which may come subsequent to one's profession of faith in Christ, and according to many does not have any bearing on one's eternal standing with God. That teaching is completely contradictory to the Word of God. Discipleship or servanthood is not optional for a Christian. It it most assuredly has direct bearing on one's eternal state. That is a discipleship commitment. Listen to these words of Jesus. Great multitudes were going along with him, the Word of God says, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters... Yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So therefore, no one of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Jesus is clearly setting before these people very specific conditions for becoming his disciple. Nothing could be clearer from that passage. He is not calling these people as Christians to a deeper commitment in their Christian life. He is stating conditions for entering the kingdom of God. And what he is saying is that no other person or thing is to have first place in our hearts ahead of him. It's important to note that the same scripture that is found in Mark 8, 34 is reiterated for us here in this passage in Luke 14, 27. Whoever does not take up his cross and come after me or follow me cannot be my disciple. And we saw from Mark 8, 34 that that is a condition for entering the kingdom of God. Therefore, since Luke 14, 27 is the same verse and is dealing with discipleship, just as Mark 8 did, this also speaks about the condition for conversion. That means that contextually, the whole passage in Luke 14, 25 to 33 is dealing with conversion, with entering the kingdom of God. The law of God reveals to us that we have been created to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that we are to have no other gods before him. That's the two greatest commandments. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. We were created by him and for him, we're told in Colossians 1. Now, that means that he is to be the supreme love of our lives. Our lives are to be submitted to him. His will is to be the controlling principle of our lives. Thus, when Jesus sets forth in this passage these conditions for discipleship, he is simply saying that if men are to enter the kingdom of heaven, they must turn back to the relationship they were originally created to fulfill. They must forsake the idols of their hearts. So Jesus is simply defining biblical repentance in this passage in Luke 14. This is exactly what he told the rich young ruler. Give all you own, give it away, and then come and follow me. Forsake all. When he becomes the Lord and the love of one's life, then God takes his rightful place in the heart of an individual. For Jesus is God. God, you see, is not looking for penance. He's looking for repentance, as defined by Jesus in Luke 14 and Mark 8. 
This is dealing seriously with sin. This is facing my relationship with God. This is facing my purpose for creation and realizing I'm a creature and that God has me in this life for an ultimate purpose and it is not for the fulfillment of my own desires and my own will and my ambitions. It is to know Him, to love Him, to be submitted to Him and to glorify Him in all that I am and do. And unless one fulfills the conditions in Luke 14 to become the love servant of Jesus Christ, one cannot become a Christian. And one is not a Christian. See, these describe the nature of repentance and a biblical saving repentant faith, which is essential for salvation and which is an essential part of saving faith, that, that repentance, that turning from these things to become a disciple. And what he's saying is that unless you deal with these things and turn from them, In our study on Mary, we spoke about a particular devotion to her that is promoted by the Roman Catholic Church called Holy Slavery. We stated that such a devotion is idolatry because it gives to Mary the place that belongs to God and Jesus Christ alone. Well, here in this passage, in Luke 14, Jesus Christ is saying that true Christianity involves a commitment and devotion of holy slavery to himself. Apart from such a commitment, a person is not a Christian. They have never truly repented and exercised saving faith because they are still living in sin. Their lives are dominated by self and selfish ambitions and a love for self rather than true love for Jesus Christ. I want to read the vow of consecration again that's promoted by the Roman Catholic Church toward Mary. I choose thee this day for my mother and mistress. I deliver and consecrate to thee as thy slave my body, my goods, both interior and exterior, leaving to thee the entire and full right of disposing of me and of all that belongs to me without exception according to thy good pleasure for the greater glory of God in time and eternity. Well, that's the kind of prayer that should be prayed exclusively to Jesus Christ. That is the kind of total devotion, submission, and commitment that he demands as God and which he enunciates for us in Luke 14. And to give this to Mary is pure idolatry. And the person caught up in that kind of false devotion must repent and give it exclusively to Jesus Christ or that person will perish in their sins. But at least the prayer illustrates the kind of commitment that should be directed to Christ himself. Let me illustrate this for you by the consecration vow of Jonathan Edwards. Listen to his words. I claim no right to myself. No right to this understanding, this will, these affections that are in me. Neither do I have any right to this body or its members. No right to this tongue, to these hands, feet, ears, or eyes. I've given myself clear away and not retained anything of my own. I've been to God this morning and have told him that I have given myself wholly to him. I have given every power so that for the future I claim no right to myself in any respect. I take him as my whole portion and felicity, looking upon nothing else as any part of my happiness. His law is the constant rule of my obedience. I pray God for the sake of others to look upon this as a self-dedication and receive me as his own. Henceforth, I am not to act in any respect as my own. I purpose to be absolutely his. There is indeed a holy slavery in the Christian life, which is an essential part of biblical faith, but it is not to Mary. It is to Jesus Christ, who is God, and who alone, therefore, can legitimately claim such devotion. Another important passage which brings out this same point is Romans 6.22. It says, Therefore, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your fruit resulting in sanctification and the outcome eternal life. And note the phrase, enslaved to God. It says, having been freed from sin, which as we have seen means self-will, And then having been brought into a relationship with God of submission and surrender that is characterized by being his slave, the verse says that there are certain results. It says you derive your fruit resulting in sanctification and the outcome eternal life. Now eternal life and fruit are the direct result of an individual's turning from sin by God's grace to become a servant of God. If the person is not a servant, he has not been freed from sin, and there will be no sanctified life, no fruit, and no eternal life. Therefore, this verse shows us conclusively that total commitment to Christ is the essence of true faith and the foundation to a life of sanctification and good works. 
Now, this will help us to understand what James is dealing with in his epistle when he speaks of faith and its relationship to justification. Scripture teaches that biblical faith will always, without exception, produce a life of good works which are characterized by love and holiness. Biblical faith does not claim works as a ground of merit and salvation, but it always proves its reality in the manifestation of good works. The epistle of James warns us against a faith which is empty and vain, and he emphasizes the necessity of good works. Many people misunderstand James' teaching to mean that he's affirming works as a basis for justification, which seems to contradict the teaching of the Apostle Paul. That is not the case at all. James is dealing with the nature of saving faith while Paul is dealing with the nature of justification. Paul emphasizes the fact that justification is received by faith completely apart from works. That is the nature of justification. James says that true biblical faith, a faith that truly saves and justifies, will always be accompanied by works. He's dealing with the nature of true faith. And he warns us that there is a faith which is false. A faith that he says is empty or vain and which some men had embraced, thinking that it had brought them into salvation or a justified state with God, and they've been deceived. And what he means by that is a faith which acknowledges the objective facts of God and Christ and salvation to be true, but which in some way negates the other essential elements of trust and commitment. The demons, he says, believe and they perish. So the warning is against a faith which is mere intellectual assent, <clears throat> as opposed to a faith which commits itself to the person of Christ. Intellectual assent is a part of saving faith. But James says an intellectual assent alone is empty. It does not save, for it does not bring one into union with the source of salvation because it is void of true repentance. The Holy Spirit effects that, that true repentance and that new life. It's a gift as a person trusts in and commits to Christ as a person. Where there is a true union with Jesus Christ, there will be, without exception, the transformed life of holiness, which evidences that union. That, that is, the holiness evidences that union. But where there is no holiness of life, which primarily has to do with heart attitudes and motives, this is evidence that men have never truly repented and believed in Christ. This is why it is possible to have many women in both the Protestant and Roman Catholic churches who profess the name of Jesus Christ, but whose lives are characterized by sin. They live in sin. They live for the world and for themselves. And they may be doctrinally very orthodox from their own perspective. They may have great knowledge. They may be very committed to the church. They may be outwardly very moral but they still live in the grip of self and pride. What's the deciding factor that makes the difference between a faith that is true and a faith that's vain? James speaks of faith that is living, is that which is characterized by works, or what Scripture calls the fruit of sanctification. Romans 6.22, the verse we just looked at, tells us where fruit comes from. It comes from a life that has turned from sin and has become enslaved to God. In other words, it's a life that has turned to Christ in faith in which the individual not only turned from all works to Christ, turned from all works to trust in him as Savior, but has also turned from all sin and is committed to Christ as Lord. He has become a slave of Jesus Christ. And both Protestants and Roman Catholics need to understand that apart from such commitment, there is no true faith and therefore no true Christianity where there is mere intellectual assent divorced from true trust and commitment, there can be orthodox assent to truth and devotion to religious activity, but no life of true holiness and love, because the heart has not been sanctified to God and regenerated. All the benefits of salvation flow from an individual's becoming united to the person of Jesus Christ, and that can only take place as a person understands and assents to the truth of the person and work of Christ and then trusts in and commits to the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. In what sense are the present-day teachings of the Church of Rome on faith inconsistent with the biblical teaching? To understand this, we must understand the teachings of Thomas Aquinas, for it is his conception of faith which has become normative for the Roman Catholic Church. In his Summa Theologica, Aquinas gives an in-depth description of the nature of faith, 
His conception could be fairly summed up in this statement. Faith implies assent of the intellect to that which is believed. So Aquinas defines faith as that which primarily relates to the intellect. It is assent to truth. And he very clearly states that an individual must assent to all the dogmas of the church, otherwise he's completely lacking in faith. The scriptures are the foundation, but the church alone is adequate to determine the correct interpretation of scripture, and therefore an individual must implicitly assent to whatever the church teaches. And he mentions specifically the Trinity, the nature of Christ, and the sacraments as composing the major content of that faith. So faith is defined as intellectual assent to dogma. Faith for Aquinas, therefore, for the Roman Catholic Church, is viewed in purely intellectual terms. It is related to the truth of Scripture, but is primarily centered in the church itself. The major components of commitment and trust in the person of Christ himself is completely missing. Faith is believing the teachings of the church. Consequently, the true meaning of biblical faith has become tragically distorted. But the early church did not have this limited conception of faith. In the writings of the apostolic fathers, for example, you find uh, you still find the basic biblical elements of faith that are emphasized. <clears throat> the object of faith is not truth as an end in itself or even the church. The object of true saving faith, of biblical faith, are the persons of God in Christ. The Trinitarian nature of God and the human and divine natures of Christ are generally clearly spelled out in, in, in the writings of the early church. The fact that Christ has made an atonement for sin by dying in man's place but faith as it relates to salvation is presented as comprising not only the knowledge of truth, but also as turning to God through self-surrender and trust in Christ himself. Faith is therefore pictured as being opposed to works. And repentance is, is emphasized as a necessary complement to faith if one is to appropriate salvation. The early church retained the essentials of the biblical meaning of faith. But over time, the true meaning of saving faith was corrupted in the history of the church. As the understanding of the work of Christ became distorted and penance began to replace the biblical concept of repentance, the emphasis in faith eventually became centered upon knowledge and assent to doctrine, especially doctrine related to the Trinity and the person of Christ. Faith became defined as intellectual assent to the objective teachings about God and Christ and the church. The object of faith is no longer God and Christ as persons, but truths about God and Christ. And ultimately, with the sacramental teachings of the church, there's an implicit faith in the church itself and its teachings as the means by which salvation is mediated to man. This is why the Roman church calls itself the universal sacrament of salvation. So men no longer exercise faith in Christ himself for salvation. He has purchased it, but the Roman church teaches that through the sacraments, it channels that salvation to men. And the result is that though there is an intellectual assent to the truth of the person of God in Christ, there is no trust and commitment, an exclusive trust and commitment to Christ as a person. For the church and the sacraments displace him. There's no true union with Christ. For men are taught that the work of Christ is not sufficient to obtain forgiveness for all sin and that their own works and the Eucharist are necessary to procure God's favor and forgiveness and to make atonement for sin. And they're taught that baptism is the means whereby Christ indwells the heart and the individual is united to him. And the Eucharist is the means whereby his presence and union is sustained in the heart. Consequently, the faith taught by the Church of Rome is intellectual assent to dogma and is not fully biblical saving faith, for it eliminates the two very important elements of trust and commitment to the person of Jesus himself. The trust and commitment ultimately are in oneself and the church and its sacraments rather than in Christ alone. The intellectual emphasis to faith and its corresponding divergence from the biblical standard really began in a very innocent and subtle way. Irenaeus and Tertullian both refer to a rule of faith which was a doctrinal summary of what was believed by the church. Now, there's nothing innately wrong with creeds. They can be very useful aids to a synthesizing of important scriptural truth. The danger comes when men begin to think of Christianity primarily in terms of right belief, and it becomes nothing more than an orthodox doctrine. And even though Irenaeus uses the term rule of faith, faith to him is more than belief in a creed. It still included trust in and commitment to the person of Christ. 
But with the doctrinal controversies of the first few centuries centering as they did around the Trinity and the person of Christ, and with the heavy emphasis on such philosophical terms as Gnosis and Logos in opposition to the major Gnostic heresies, faith began to be viewed primarily from its intellectual aspect of ascending to correct doctrine related to Christ and God. So the Christian faith came to mean then really having right belief about them. Where the content of the Catholic faith was centered in the doctrines related to the Trinity and the nature of Christ, the meaning of faith became defined as assent to those doctrines. So over time, faith becomes defined as assent to the dogmas of the church as they became expressed in an orthodox consensus based on the formulations of the creeds and the opinions of the fathers who were considered to be orthodox interpreters of Scripture. A Roman Catholic priest and author, Warren Dickery, affirms these facts in a book that he's written called To Live the Word, Inspired and Incarnate. He says this, Catholic Christians, influenced for so many centuries by emphasis on philosophical theology, tend to stress the intellectual dimension of faith as the belief in all that God has revealed and the church teaches. Well, clearly the Roman church's dogma on faith has perverted the biblical teaching. With the exclusive emphasis on intellectual assent to doctrine, the other essential elements of commitment to and trust in Christ have been neglected. And not only that, but the teaching that they emphasize relative to intellectual assent is a depreciation and a contradiction of the word of God. The content of that faith is a perversion of the truth of Scripture because it teaches a man that it must trust in the work of man and in the church rather than in Christ alone. So the object of faith is no longer the person of Jesus himself, but the church and his teachings. With the added corruptions of repentance and baptism, you see a complete corrupting of the gospel. True salvation comes from an individual's becoming united to the person of Jesus Christ, which is a gift of God, a sovereign work of God, when he unites a man with Jesus Christ. And that man exercises repentance and faith and is regenerated by the work of the Holy Spirit. But with the intellectualizing of faith as the ascent of doctrine, the displacement of repentance with penance, the displacement of commitment to Christ in faith with baptismal regeneration, and the Eucharist as a displacement of the once-for-all sacrifice of Christ, the individual is never truly brought into union with him to truly receive his life and the benefits of his atoning sacrifice. The church and the sacraments have displaced the person of Jesus in the life of an individual. The work of man displaces the work of Christ, and Christianity becomes defined as right belief and the striving to perform good works. Because it is lost, the inward reality and dynamic of union with Jesus in the heart, Christianity loses its power and true spirituality. It becomes essentially material and external. Let me ask you, is your faith a biblical faith, truly characterized by trust in and commitment to Jesus Christ exclusively as Lord and Savior? Is Jesus Christ your Lord? Have you yielded your will to him and given him the absolute control of your life? Has he become your master and you his slave? Who do you live for today and what do you live for? Do you live for yourself do you live for this world? Is Jesus Christ your Lord? I don't mean merely in that you acknowledge Jesus to be God, but when did you actually submit the totality of your being to him as Lord? Have you ever turned from living for yourself and the world and all that it offers in terms of its pleasure and its materialism and its pride to live solely for Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God? Have you forsaken all other relationships, all material possessions, and your own life to make Jesus Christ the number one security and love of your life? Is he the first love of your life? Does he dominate your heart? Do you have a passion for him, a love for him that dominates everything else in your life? Is God truly God in your life? And is that proven out in a daily life of holiness? Is Jesus your Savior and he alone 
Or are you trusting in something other than or in addition to Jesus' blood and righteousness to give you forgiveness and acceptance with God? Are you trusting in a church, your own good works, in baptism, sacraments, penances, indulgences? Are you trusting in your own goodness and sincerity? Have you forsaken every form of works, be they religious or moral, social, and cast yourself totally by faith upon Jesus alone and trusted in him alone to save you? Have you come to him and in brokenness and humility received his merits as a gift by faith? Salvation is available only on God's terms. Have you come on God's terms?